Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Board Game Breakfast here on the Dice Tower. My name is Chris Yee. I'm Wendy Yee. And I'm Roy Kennedy. Wendy and I just got back from Washington, D.C. <gasps> Circle D.C. convention. Yeah, we did Historical Games mm -hmm. Con. Um, what did you do while we were gone? Oh, I, uh, I watched kids for spring break, part of it. I helped put up lights in the new studio and uh, uh, did a bunch of other things, you know? Yes. Had fun. Family time! Yes! Family time! Yay. We dropped our daughter off at some un... Disclosed location, and we left for the weekend. Have you got her back? Undisclosed. Oh, yeah, we did do that. We later. did. Oh, okay. One oh, piece. Okay. Oh, she watched One Piece. She watched One Piece. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, the convention was fantastic. Uh, a vlog of that should be going up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll be putting that together. Um, let's see. Dice Tower East registration <gasps> is yes. still open. Mm -hmm. So if you want to come join us the week of July fourth uh, over in Orlando, Florida. Make sure to sign up for that, DiceTowerEast.com. And then the registration just opened up for the cruise. Yes, the cruise is like my favorite it's event. It's the coolest convention period. we have. Like board games in general. I've been to tons of different conventions, Gen Con, all this stuff. The Dice Tower Cruise is like my favorite. I mean, board games, buffets, exotic locations, how can you go wrong? Board games and buffets, baby. And That's Chris will want. be there. And what? Board games, buffets, and beaches. Oh, yeah, that's the way we should brand it, oh, for sure. Yeah. The Triple Bs. Yeah. We are Triple it's B the rated knees. convention. All right. Mike Heller, thank you so much for putting the, <laughs> the links there in the live chat of there. Of course, yeah. But yeah, go ahead and check those out. Mm -hmm. uh, as for us here on this uh, nice, fine breakfast morning, let's go ahead and get started <gasps> with some eye catchers. All right, eye catcher time. This is where we take a look at something that we found on the internet that caught our eyes in board gaming. Um, the one that I'm gonna do is uh, I've been watching a lot of Three Body Problem, oh, so man. this oh, we're made not me done think. Yet. <laughs> this made me think of that. Um, this is uh, SETI. This is a. It seems like a deduction-ish game, which reminds me a little bit of Planet. X, search, search for, for Planet, Planet X. Okay. Yeah. But I really like the way the board looks is awesome. Like obviously it it it, it looks similar to other things that I enjoy, but like the star you in like the middle and I like spinning rings and things like that. And when you're doing that sort of thing with deduction as well, it seems really fun. I want to um, squish that star. So when do you calculate the gravitational pull between the one, two, three, four, five, six, however many in that solar system? Listen, if there's three stars, it makes it really, really hard. If if you're if your star system is unstable, how are you going to have survived anyway? You're lucky to have survived. You probably shouldn't have. You know, that's just the way it is. It's a good point. So, um, <laughs> obviously, you just dehydrate your people or something. I don't know. I really like <laughs> that Mercury, Venus, and Earth are all in the same rotational just, ring. Just here. like in real life. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you know what, Roy? Life will find <clears throat> a way. I guess so, maybe. That's what I learned from Jurassic yeah. Park. This looks more approachable than, say, a game like High Frontier. <laughs> I <laughs> guess. You, uh, what is it? Some people were talking to, with us about High Frontier at at uh, Circle DC, they're like, yeah, it's like, you know, you start off the rules teach by saying, how much do you know about astronomical physics? Because if, <laughs> if you do, it'll help this teach a lot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, I thought this one looked fun. I thought I'm very interested to see more as more details come out about it. Um, and I like space, obviously. You but, like uh, space? I like CGE a yes. lot. Yes. You like CG and graphics? They had, um, I know, uh, I know that uh, Z doesn't like it, but I really like the Pulsar game that they had as well, where you're kind of building up the little Dyson spheres and stuff like that. Just stuff like that interests me. So I'm even though that's more of a like abstract style game, I still get into it because it's like, oh, I'm doing stuff with the space things. You yeah, that's fun. Well, so this designer, uh, Tomas Holek, mm -hmm. his other game is the oh, Galileo yeah, like Galilee Galileo. one. Hmm. So that one's coming out this year I, too. That so. was on. Was that on your eye catcher at one point? Maybe. I, don't or know, I, but I think I remember you talking either that or you were talking to me about it in the studio where they were talking about it on the news and I felt like Chris was excited about it, but I don't remember. But yeah, yeah, apparently he's got a type and he likes to Oh that board's pretty And that too. type is kind of my type. This isn't hey. thematic, but it's fine. It is yeah. thematic, but not thematic the same way I think of thematic. Interesting. Yeah, that's a cool eye catcher. So yours was particularly um SETI. Search for uh search for extraterrestrial Terrestrial. intelligence. All right, right, Wendy, your eye catcher. Okay, my eye catcher is Night Witches. So at Circle DC, I got to peek at this a little bit, um, play a little bit of it. But this is based in World War Oops. II, and it specifically really zones in um, into this idea of the Night Witches. So the Night Witches were an all-female um, flight crew? Flight? What do you call that? Squadron. Squadron, there you go. Um, and basically what they did is they had really just 
basic, basic planes, like no offensive, defensive, whatever capabilities at all. All they did was drop bombs and fly around. And these ladies were amazing, amazing pilots. And they basically would come in the dead of dark night. They would somehow find their targets. They would bomb them. And all they could do against like the big AAA guns and stuff like that is just maneuver around them and stuff. And so they would do run after run after run in the evenings. They would have like five minutes rest between. Like they were just like, go, 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 go all night for years. So yeah, that's crazy. It's super impressive. And this game was very approachable, which surprised me as it's cooperative and you're just, um, it's like two planes, two teams of planes or whatever going. So it's, it was cool. I'm excited about it. Mm. There's no like images or anything of it yet. This is just like a picture of some of the squadron there. But you know, Tool is going to be doing the artwork. Oh, nice. Which yeah. is going to be nifty. Um, uh, Liz Davidson. Liz! I know, yeah. Liz Davidson. Who, awesome. Who she did, uh, well, she, the Beyond Solitaire channel, she does mm -hmm. that still. Um, and mm -hmm. she did reviews for the Dice Tower for a long time. And she was the like historical game expert. Oh, nice. Uh, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. So she and David Thompson, who is one of my favorite designers, uh, the two of them working together. Where'd that picture go? There you go. Um, they were both there at Circle DC. We they got were. to talk that was with really them. Cool and them. They taught it to us and everything. It was that was super neat. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Really good experience. And that's what I don't know. I like that idea that these these historical games look so unapproachable, and a lot of them are ton of where there was one that someone was talking about you have to play three starting scenarios before you can even play a real scenario so you have to invest like six hours into it wow. before you can even play your first game oh Churchill. officially no yeah. it wasn't Churchill it was it started with a P Sisyphus or something Sis something Pericles. Like that. Pericles oh yeah, yeah. there you go yeah mm. um, but then you have this that is just like this cooperative campaign but you don't have to do it as a campaign you can just grab a map mm, and cool. get your characters ready and go and so I like that it, there's the sense of becoming more approachable to us hobby gamers because I'm not a historical gamer typically. I'm not a war gamer typically. Right. Um, yeah. No. So that was uh, that was excellent. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing more. Mm -hmm. It's coming from Fort Circle Games, who does a good job with their productions and stuff oh, too. Oh, sweet. Uh, and then my eye catcher this week is that uh, Unexpected Games put out their first uh, pocket puzzle based oh, on yeah. the initiative. So mm. the initiative was a game that we reviewed, and and none of us in the review like loved the game. It had a lot of interesting concepts. I feel like a lot of a lot of uh, his Corey Kaneska's stuff from the company he has. Uh, all all of them are like, oh, they're fun, but like, hmm, okay, that's cool. They're great concepts, and the thing is, for me, that the initiative, I didn't love the card play, move mm. around the board, but I did love the cipher. Yeah. So yeah. the pocket puzzles are. Just the cipher. Oh, that's cool. So there's only one of them up so far, right? But there's a category here. Guess the three words here. And so every one of these characters relates to a letter in English. And so guess the three words. Hint, the, the, the category is rise and shine. So if you just clicked on this thing here, it'll unveil what that letter is and any other instances of it. So this letter right here we know is the same one as in this word here. So when you click one, it reveals it all. And it only gives you four characters to reveal and you have to guess the phrase. Mm -hmm. mm. So uh, I won't show it here, but I mean it's, it really is easy that. Click on it, boom, you have both the characters revealed. Yeah. Um, oh, you can cool. see that these ones here are two of the same character in a row, uh, but it's not going to be represented anywhere else. Whereas the letter at the end of the second word is the third letter of the second word, or the, of the third word. And so it's just a fun, I like these cipher kind of puzzles so much. So I'm excited for the next one to go up. And, I thought this was smart, after the next one goes up, if you missed an earlier one, this one here is going to be a drop down menu where you can go and do previous days as well. Do we know when there's going to be another puzzle? I don't know exactly. Just kind of waiting and seeing. Or yeah. there could not be anymore because it's just April first, so it's April. 1st. <laughs> oh, is it just an April Fool's thing? No, no. He said that they've got, they've got more in here, um, more in the hopper, but yeah. they're gonna they're kind of spacing them out because they don't have like they don't have like a daily one or anything like that. Yeah, but I agree that like if it's the puzzle that's the interesting part of the game, I just want to do more puzzle. Yeah, so I thought this mm -hmm. was I thought this so was cool. groovy. I'm really anticipating the next one. Oh, nice. That's awesome. It's gonna be the new Wordle. Yeah, so we'll there you go. See. That, folks, is our eye catchers. Let's move on to some contributors. This is a segment where we take a look at a board game based on an IP, and I tell you if the IP and the mechanisms match. Today we're looking at Disney's Pre Princess Present Party. On your turn, you're going to spin the spinner, 
And if it falls in this box, for example, I'm gonna draw three tiles from the bag. So let's say I drew something like this, because the number has three on it, it would go here in front of my character. If it has a bow tie, I have to give that many presents to somebody else. So I don't wanna give away a bell one, because that goes with her. So I have to give away two, maybe I'll give away these two. If they don't apply to her, I wanna make sure I keep the bell one. If it's right here, when you have this little line here, it tells you that you'll be tra you'll be trading with them. So if you're in a situation where somebody has something that you need, let me give you an example here. Let's say I had these two Cinderella ones. Maybe we could make this exchange to so Cinderella get two of the six of what she is requiring. The game continues until the bag is empty and we have pulled all of the tiles out of the bag. At that point, everybody can make one more gift or a trade if they want to. And if every princess has all six of their items, the presents that are set aside for them, then the players cooperatively win the game. If not, you will lose the game. This is a silly little game, a cooperative game for younger gamers. I think it fits that niche. Uh, does it matter that it's princesses? I guess not. The princesses are on there just to sell the game, I suppose. But it does work at the princesses. You can imagine it being where they're doing a swap exchange of presents, and they're trying to find their own presents, and we're giving them away, and et cetera. It works okay, I guess. To us, this is one of the weaker ones in the line, probably because it skews so young, where only my youngest of gamer, Sawyer, he's the one that probably enjoys it the most because it's very, very simple. Um, but for the rest of them, I think they've outgrown this. So for most families, this one's not going to hit the target rate. Do the IP and the mechanisms match? Not really. It's kind of a silly what's going on. I think if Ariel was there in their presence, she would just walk up and get her presence. The fact that Tiana's holding on to them until we swap them and stuff is kind of bizarre. So eh, it doesn't really work in that regard. Happy breakfast, everyone. Today I'm here to talk to you about Mimic Octopus, which is one of three Mimic games. This is the Mimic Octopus Original Edition. There's also the Flirt, or the Cringe Edition, which then maybe it sounds just a little bit too much for me, but this is a perfect silliness vibe, as you are sort of subtly hinting at what's on your cards. So there's a number of piles of cards. The game comes pre-sorted in a certain order, so you don't need to shuffle or work out an order. Three cards, they're all going to be identical, but then you take some more piles, depending on the player count, shuffle them up and deal them out to the players. Then you're going to be subtly hinting at what's on your card to work out if you're on my team, maybe they're on my team, no one's on my team, or no one's on my team, but someone's gonna think I am. That's pretty much the entirety of the game. You're gonna be just chatting, throwing in some little hints, so maybe your card is, you've got a song stuck in your head, so every now and again you just bring the conversation back to music, or just like, <laughs> start humming it, and all of a sudden, maybe someone across the table goes, hmm. They look down at their card and you're like, okay, I think someone is on my team and no one else is. So I'm gonna put my hand up. Because when half the team half the table, sorry, have put their hand up, then the round ends, and that's when you go in and say, three, two, one, you're on my team, that sort of thing, and you work out who's right, wrong, and there's points accordingly. This is definitely a sort of silly-ish sort of game as you're doing some very weird and funny oddities based on what's on the cards. If that's gonna be for you, then Mimic Octopus might be great at the next party game night that you're doing. If it's a bit too silly for you, maybe pass on it though. That is Mimic Octopus from Brain Games, and enjoy the rest of your breakfast. All right, for our top 10 today, we have the top 10 reasons not to buy a well-reviewed game. So there are a lot of games out there that get a ton of buzz, they get a ton of hype. You want to buy them. Sometimes we have to convince ourselves that no, we don't need this game. Or maybe we just really don't want to buy it. We might have good reasons as to not to. Um, as with all of our top tens during breakfast, go ahead and share your comments, uh, what you think some of the cool answers are that you've come up with, and uh, I will pick one to be our number one answer. So let's go ahead and get started with that. My number 10 for me is not physically having enough room. Okay, if you don't have room for more board games, if they are like lining your hallways or your living room in your house, maybe you don't need to buy the next hottest game. 
Get more hallways. <laughs> That's the solution, right? <laughs> Those need a calyx right there, baby. That yeah. was actually when we moved. <laughs> That's why they're stacked up. That's, oh, really? That's like that's your our, actual that's house? That's our actual house. Yeah, we, yeah. we just moved it you all You better find a show for that Gizmos. That Gizmos is going nowhere. Ooh. Oh, no, that Gizmos it's is staying. staying. I wonder how many of these have we moved out, actually? How many have you gotten rid of? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Still, Not that many. Still got Cat in the Box? Yeah. We've still got, got Cat in the Box, yeah. Two shelves. We do actually have board games on the floor in our house right now because, because chaos. I mean, part of it is it's bringing stuff home from work, but yeah. yeah. Anyway, we need to we need to purchase more hallways. We do. Yeah, or just get another five by five calyx. That could work. I think hallways is a cheaper solution. Probably an extension on the house. Yeah. Uh, who's up next? Is this Roy or is this me? I think it's me. I, I think it's you. Hi. Number nine is that the game length just won't work for you. Um, huh. There might be some great games. There might be some amazing stuff. But if you know that you don't like games over two and a half hours, don't buy Weimar. Um, the general expected playtime on it is three to six hours. Ooh. So, mm. yeah. Sounds like not a blast. If that's not that's, what you want, don't get it. That's get, cute. Three to six hours, ha. Get Working. a different game. All um, right. That makes a lot of sense. Number cool. eight, Roy. My number eight here is your friend already has a copy of the game. Oh my goodness, that's Aww. an amazing game. But my friend already has it, and I play games with them a lot, so, you know, I might as well just play their copy of the game. And... Once again, no safe space at my house. So that's a or good reason. Or my work already has it. That's my excuse. That that is that is another thing. big part of this. But I didn't want to necessarily do all of that my, in people's faces. Yeah. All of my experience, because I could have easily been like, I'm hoping to like just bar from work instead, or just because <laughs> not everybody has that sort of situation. But uh, I did have this happen a lot for me, like when I was back in North Carolina. Like, oh, my friends have a lot of these games. I'll get the games they don't have, and then they get the games I don't have, and that way, you know, we we save on not having to buy every single game. We still get to play every single game. It is funny when a game group, everybody in the game group is excited about the same game they all yes. buy it and then they only play it with each other right yeah yes. so that like, happens a lot too whose copy we're gonna play this time randall's i guess <laughs> or there's the one guy that does want to keep his in shrink so it's like yeah. we'll play your copy so that way i can keep mine pristine right <laughs> all right next up number seven wendy all right if you have no one to play it with you don't need to buy it i have talked to so many people that are like oh this is my convention game because i just play it only at conventions but also the convention library has it, so I mm. don't even need to bring it. Like, why did you buy it in the first place, okay? If you know that it's not going to fit your gaming group, the people that you game with, and you can't play it solo, don't buy it. It's okay. If you're going to go to a convention, someone probably has it if it's really hot. If it's a really <laughs> well-regarded, highly-reviewed game, someone's going to have it. But what if you like to just have it on your pillow with you, like beside you while you then sleep? Then you're you weird. Know? Don't talk about this, Roy, okay? <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, I did air that, your dirty laundry there, Chris. Is that what you do when I'm gone? Shh. You snuggle breath? Mm. Oh, you have someone to play that with. Me. Yeah, it's a feast for road. Number six, it's too similar to other games you already oh. own. Yeah. Right? If you have all of these games that kind of scratch the same itch, you don't quite need the seventh, um, you know, dry your game about manufacturing that uses card hand management resource kind of stuff. You know, if, if you realize, like, oh, I have a lot of similar stuff, and I don't play the ones I already have enough. Mm. You're, you're good. You can skip out on this particular one. So, yeah, number six. What are you going to say? Something? I was going to say, I think that goes back with the not having enough physical room of, like, in either one of those scenarios, feel free to take one out and put a new one in mm. if you're really excited about it. Um, but if you aren't going to do that, step aside. Le leave it be. What did Joey say last uh, mailbag where he's like, the one in, one out policy only works if you're replacing stuff with the same size. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number five, Roy. Um, too much of an investment. So a lot of times there's really good games. I enjoy collectible card games. I enjoy miniatures games. I enjoy mm -hmm. a lot of stuff like that. But you have to like spend a decent amount. You can play these things casually. But sometimes it's like even just tasting that stuff can be too much of a danger. Like the new Star Wars Unlimited is an amazing game. I think it's really good. But I'm not going to uh, do the capital investment I would need to do to get to the same level as someone who's buying singles for the game. Um, but no, um, I, uh, I still really enjoy these games. I think it is fun for people that do want to do it. But that's a reason why a game that I think, even I think, is really good, I wouldn't actually get into is because it's going to be too much to get a hold of. That's know your addiction. <laughs> anything that's collectible, <laughs> no. anything that you need yeah. to amass an army or do point buys and stuff like that. This works the same as like Warhammer 40K or different things like that. And sometimes you do that investment and then realize you've invested 
way too much more than uh, your opponents, and then they don't want to do the investment again. So it's like you have to be on even tiers with those people. I've even heard people say that about like not necessarily collectible games, but games right. like Dominion, where they're like, "Nah, that's a rapid hole. I don't need to fall down." Right, like, or games with tons of expansion, like Dominion. Yeah, you know, like expansion yeah. thing can also get a hold of people. You know. Yeah, that's a good point. That's fair. Number four. Oh, that's me. I know I won't like it, okay? I know what kind of games I like. And I am all for trying out games that are not in my wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. Like, I I will play confrontational games. In fact, this weekend I played confrontational games um, because I want to figure out why people like them and I want to learn to like things. But I'm not going to go out of my way to buy a game just because everyone loves it if I know I'm not going to like it. Right. You know what I mean? I'll play someone else's copy of Scythe or something like that if I'm not as interested in it and I know I don't really enjoy it. Twilight Struggle. Yeah, yeah exactly. Say, I basically typed this in here and I was like, oh, Wendy already has it in here. Oh, <laughs> I knew, I knew I was, I was like, I was like, I was like, I won't like the game. And I'm like, oh, Wendy already has, I won't like the game. <laughs> but Roy, this is the highest rated dry Euro game on the Dice Tower ever. Why won't you play it? <sighs> not or high, buy it? Not highly rated by me. Then. Right. <laughs> yes. All right, number three. Uh, it's not currently in your market, right? This is a tough one, right? Because there's a lot of games that are that you're excited about and everything, but like for example, this one here, Video Game Champion, is going to come to the U.S. market. Thankfully, mm. not every game does, and I understand right. that. But a great game can still be great, but you don't necessarily need to own it. You don't need to pay an exorbitant price for it and like import it from somewhere else just because like oh, I heard that the Dice Tower likes this game or something, or I heard some people mm -hmm. talk about this game and I don't live in the market for it. Mm. I think that really great games will tend to get picked up and have wider distribution, and if not, it's also okay to not own that one. Gotcha. Yeah, that's fair. Or come to a Dice Tower convention and play it there. That's hey. the truth yeah. of it. That's the truth of it. <laughs> and then wait patiently for it to actually come to your market. Yeah. <laughs> right. I think that some people really enjoy buying international games. Like, yeah. that is the part of the hobby they really enjoy. And so I think that there is a difference between, like, I'm going after this because of hype or... This is specifically the type of stuff I like to get in general. Right. I love importing Japanese obscure card games and things yeah. like that. That's but, perfectly... But don't be the person right. that when it does come to the market, you're like, oh, you have the American version? I have <laughs> yeah. Come if on. If you're going to drop a grand for a game just because it's not in your market, like, think about it. Think about it first. <laughs> right. Take a minute. All right. Number two. Mine is slightly similar to that. It's just currently out of print. Like, it's hard to get a hold of. Like, so it's like, oh, man, everybody loved that game. It, mm -hmm. it flew off the shelves, and, and I'm waiting for it to cut, get another print run. That's another thing is, like, Tom Vassell's law. If a game's good enough, it's going to come back into print. Yeah. And he's like, at this point, even if it's not good enough, it'll probably still come back into print <laughs> at some point. But, yeah, I just don't, once again, you don't have to spend an absorbent amount of money to get something that's really hard to get a hold of. Things are normally going to come back into print, and a lot of times they have better yeah. versions when they do come back. They have so. better versions. Or there's other great games that you could have just spent that money and that time and mm -hmm. effort hunting down. Good stuff is coming out constantly. We're and a lot of games are not wildly re unique, like you said in a previous one. Mm, I right. mean, like, they're, something else will fill that niche for you. Find something that will fill it for All you. right. The big number one moment. I think this is another Mike Keller. Mike, you are just, like, rocking it all the time Which in this. Which one was it? Um, but he said, if it's on Board Game Arena, why uh, not right buy it? Right there, right there. So uh, it's, uh, slide it down. Slide down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike Keller's one right there. Ban or add to broadcast? Oh, add to broadcast. Add to broadcast, yeah. <laughs> you can just play it online. Why bother buying it? Well, it, it does depend on your group. but Depends on your group. Yeah, but no, that's a good point. I've played a yeah. lot of stuff recently on Board Game Arena. Mike himself being responsible for uh, so, you know, <laughs> starting about seven different games that I've jumped into. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm playing all these. Mm -hmm. But it's really neat. I'm, and I'm glad it scratches that itch. And I'm like, I don't need to own this particular one mm -hmm. because I already have very easy access to it. It's a really cool opportunity in some cases to try before you buy too, which I think is amazing because then you'll know, do I like the game? Is this going to work with my group? Like it answers a lot of those questions that we had listed as reasons not to buy. Right. And then you might make a better purchase because of it instead. Right. Right. All right. Well, there you go. There we go. That's the top 10. Mm-hmm. 
Hi everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, today we're going to be talking about The Lord of the Rings Adventure to Mount Doom. Basically, you, it's a cooperative game where all of us are taking on these roles of the Fellowship of the Ring characters yeah. as we are trying to get as close to Mordor as possible and ultimately have the ring bearer finish off the, I, the deal by getting the ring into Mount Doom. Uh, so what's happening is you are trying to move all these characters along this path. It does use a roll and move mechanism, which sounds boring and outdated right? Yeah. But it actually does it in a very unique way. You have all these different characters, you're going to choose two of them to roll, uh, and then out of those two, you're going to choose one of them that you actually use. One of the results. One of the results. Yeah. And then you're going to be able to dip back into that pool, roll two more dice, and figure out which one of those you're going to use. So it's, you have a little bit of control within the chaos of the die rolls, which is a, a novel way of doing that. Yeah. Yeah, and all the dies are different colors and they correlate to the standees of the board, so that's how you can figure out what's happening on the board. But what I think is really interesting is that you kind of want to move everybody all at the same time, but you can't. So you're going to focus on certain people and then you need to bring these people up. And in our first game, absolutely hilarious because Gimli would always roll a low number. And I just, just got it. along to the best, to the best just, his little legs can. He's only good at sprinting. <laughs> <laughs> he's not good at a long distance. I just got a huge kick out of that. Like, I know the game can't make that happen. That was just a chance. But it was absolutely delightful in our first game. Like, Gimli's just, like, struggling behind. We're like, come on, Gimli, keep up. <laughs> Thematically, there's these locations that you're going to throughout the game, and they all are based off of locations in the Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, mythos, and they all have the characters and different events that happen in those areas as well. So as you're kind of going through, it feels like you're going on this Lord of the Rings adventure. There's almost this narrative, this story that's happening. It's almost like you're going on an adventure, adventure to Mount, to Mount Doom. Doom. Yeah. Very, yeah. <laughs> so I think thematically they did a great job tying all that together, keeping it in the Lord of the Rings realm. Yeah. Well, everybody, if you want to hear more from us, make sure to find us on YouTube. We are Ryan and Bethany at Board Game Reviews. Everybody, this is Ryan. I'm Bethany, hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. Bye, Bye guys. Hi, it's Tarrant. And Stella from Maple University. And today we have Darwin's Journey. Yes, this is a worker placement Euro from last year. Very point salad. So it's quite, it's quite interesting, right? We've yeah, got, it's very um, clever. Workers that you have to upgrade with seals to have certain combinations so that they can go and take other actions. So many things that you want to do. I cannot figure out how to beat Tarrant yet. Let me know if you have any tips. But there are so many things, like you can sail the ships, you can go exploring the island once you sail the ships further enough, you can collect specimens, but they're all kind of like interlocking and comboing each other mm. in a way. The first few turns, it, everything is so expensive. Everything is so hard to do. Yeah. Where you get the money from, right? But you know, hey, that's that's the type of game that is. You just have to manage manage things. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, it does have a little bit of that uh, that tight feel and that uh, competitive worker placement feel. It's not always competitive worker placement spots, but I think what probably for me is cleverest about this game is the way it uses lenses to bring stronger actions into the game because it costs you a lot of money to bring a new action into the game, but when you do it, you're allowed to take that action without having the seals you would normally need to take that action, because that usually takes a couple rounds longer to get. So I think that's a really clever mechanism for bringing stronger yeah. actions into the game quickly. That is true, and I feel like two players is tighter than four players, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have like, like a mechanic that limits certain things for two players, but like money. Hang on, where can I get the money? Money's tight. Money's tight, and that's Darwin's journey. Have you played it? Let us know. And thanks for watching. Have a great day. Bye. What we do here is go back, 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 back. All right, well, it's old school game time. We're going back. I know it's not that far ago, but 2008 is still, uh, you know, that's still a lifetime for it some gamers. It was the beginning of our, like, true into deep hobby board gaming. Mm-hmm. I think yeah. it counts. The game we're taking a look at today is Dominion. This is the original deck building game that just kind of um, really opened up the genre a ton. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, well, I mean, when you look at this cover, it definitely looks, definitely looks old school. I'm trying to think, Roy, you, you were around in gaming even before us. 
Was this cover laughably bad so, when it came out? So my Dominion story, so I used to work at Target back in the day, and they didn't carry Dominion. They didn't carry nearly as many board games back then, but they sold this online, apparently. Someone had returned it to the store, and I saw it, and I was into board games, and I saw Dominion, and I'm like, I don't know. Like, I, <laughs> like I'd seen Tom's review of it and everything, and I looked at the front of it, I looked at the back of the box, I'm like, it just doesn't look good to me. And like, I was going back and forth. I like, I called my friend. I'm like, hey, there's this clearance board game. Like, they say it's good, but like, I don't know because we were already playing. I think Carcassonne looks fine and stuff like that. We played Carcassonne and a bunch of other games like at the time. I was still really big into D and D, but I was like, I don't know about this Dominion thing. And my friend was like, oh, I'll go in half on it with you or whatever if you want to get it. And so like, we ended up like both paying for it or whatever. And we played it and we really enjoyed the game. It was crazy because like how how much like the cover and the art in the game and everything just deterred me from getting it. But I still had a blast with it once I actually played it. No. Yeah. This was my number one game for a long time um, with the top 100. This was like our family game. Like we played it all the time, multiple days a week. We'd go over to Chris's brother's house. He'd come over to our house. There was just like Massive amounts of Dominion being played all the time for probably a year and a half to two years of our life. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we did everything too. Like, we had Dominion, we had the first expansion, Intrigue, which came with more um, basic cards so that we could play this with six people because that's what my family did. <laughs> you know, things that I look at now, I'm like, oof, I don't think I'd play six player Dominion. But we did so yeah. much back then. We even in the got day. your mom to play this regularly. Yeah. There's not another board game that she has, I think, even touched practically. But yeah, Dominion, she played regularly with us. Yeah. I um, remember buying Prosperity for my friend for his birthday or whatever as part of like, we, we enjoyed so much. I'm like, oh, Prosperity is the expansion we need to get. His birthday came up. I'm like, oh, we're going to get Prosperity too. It adds in all this stuff. I watched the reviews, you know? So I remember yeah, getting, fun. getting Seaside and the first time playing those duration cards, I was like, I can't keep track of them. I always forget my duration cards. Like I just remember being so hard to conceptually deal with duration cards. And I'm like, that's just like nothing now. But it was a lot at first. It's funny because because of the production of this of this box mm. with like the uh, the specific insert that was made to hold all the different cards and everything, that strip. Well it's actually not in this picture, but there's a strip down the middle that's supposed to uh have show like you. all the different cards, yeah, like that. Yeah, show you where yeah. exactly everything goes. There you go. Yeah, so I remember, like, our family thought that, like, like, dude, Rio Grande does like wicked good production of games. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yes, with we the, did. Like the seaside set came with those metal coins, you know, that you could use for different purposes. We're like, oh my goodness, so high quality. This is so high quality because we played a lot of Risk and Access and Allies growing up. So right. I mean, this was kind of our big gateway game. My brother introduced us to Catan. Munchkin and Dominion, and Dominion was the one that really clicked with my whole family. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, hardcore. This is the game that got us into the hobby the way that we are. And it still stands up to die, man. It's still fun to pull out. This is still the game my mom mm -hmm. plays with the old ladies in her apartment complex. That's awesome. Like she just always keeps a game of Dominion <laughs> set up on her lazy Susan. That's <laughs> this is what she does. Yeah, I had, uh, back in the day, they had, like, an iOS app for this. It was not official, but, like, I played so, so, so many games of base game. I mean, I would just click the randomizer and just play against random computers. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure I clocked up, like, 300 games or something like that. I mean, you know, just did not break at work. It's, like, really easy to go through really quick. Um, and I play tons of games with people, but... Uh, but yeah, I love Dominion. It's great. We did, wow, like two years ago, I think we did like a top 10 most played games. Mm. And Dominion, I think, was my number two. Because my number one was Can't Stop because of Board Game Arena. Oh, sure. Oh, gotcha. I've wow. literally played that hundreds, yeah. hundreds of times. Uh, but yeah, Dominion's, I think, pretty solidly number two. And what really depressed me was the fact that like other country editions have like a way better cover. Yeah, what is this? <laughs> Look at that. Was for it? I can't even read it. Um, was, was für eine Welt, right? Welt. I don't care if it's in German. I would probably own this one and deal with the German cards. I think, <laughs> I think for the base game, I would still know all of the cards. Just well, based on the art. Just based on the art. What if the art yeah. was different too? What if the art's too? different? Because this art's different. Oh, I'd be like, I think this one's Thief, guys. <laughs> if you just Google Translate <laughs> once, then you're fine. Just you Google would Translate definitely... picture. As long as you know how to say the words action and buy and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the coin will look the same. Yeah, right? But look at this one! This one, I forget uh, if this is like the Hungarian cover. I remember like first seeing that this, there were other 
Why uh, are there different covers? I just different know. countries, right? Just different countries and stuff. Those countries even, are like, we're not importing that game with that cover. Seriously? And you know what? Kudos to them. Look, they, even, <laughs> they even have, they changed the font. They don't have the big swirly O's like wrapped up in the middle of other letters and oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Wow. So I wonder huh. if the card backs are different. Uh, if you have pictures of one of these editions of the game, I would love to see it. Oh, yeah. You're Seriously, right. please so do. Nice. Yeah, like I... Yeah, oh, the o, interlocking O's. Yeah. The O's are taking over. They're, they're dominating. They That they are. That's what's... That's what's... <laughs> That's what's dominant. Now, of course, uh, Rio Grande did come out with the second edition, which looks better, like clearly yeah. better, but not like, I still prefer those other language ones uh, more. And so. it still has the weird O's. Still has the weird, they're never going to change the card back. Yeah, Kinda like how Magic the Gathering at this yeah, point right. can't change the card right. back. Oh, could you imagine the upheaval? Wait, so if you buy one of those like extension packs, what if it actually comes from another country? Or what if you buy an American one? Then you shouldn't do that. Oh my goodness. Because it's not going to match. Yeah. That's like almost this everything. This is blowing though. my mind. How does it work? Seems pretty basic to me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what happens if I buy a Russian copy of like, an expansion? Is it going to fit with my American copy? <laughs> no. The other thing, uh, one last thing before we finish talking about Dominion. Notice here that on the artists here. One thing is it will look better. That is what we know. Sure. Uh, oh. Of the artists attributed to Dominion, Ryan Lockett. Oh, that's cool. Ryan Lockett was the, uh, this was his first illustration in that's the board game. That's crazy. Really? So he did Adventurer in the base game and uh, a few others he's done in a lot of the expansion sets, like when there's like piles of money, treasure vault and that type of stuff. He does a lot of the coins. When you buy the updated basic cards that have like the bars of copper and bar bars of gold and like piles of copper and stuff, that's Ryan Lockett. I would love really? if they made like mm -hmm. an artist edition of Dominion, even just the base set, and just had like oh. had different artists like just make it look beautiful. That would be crazy. I mean, I'd buy. I feel like that, that could be, that'd be amazing. A whole Kickstarter thing, right? You know what yeah. I mean, that could be it's a like, whole we'll campaign. This one, we'll make this one. I mean, I'm sure Rio Grande will never do it, but hey, there you go, Rio Grande. Want to make money? That's how you do it. Make super cool artist versions. Even just the basic game, yeah, get Ian yeah. O'Toole to do one. Get Ryan Lockett to kind of like really gussy up. Be a like, few okay, more. we're going to make this in get. Arzium or whatever, you know? It's like, that would be yeah. crazy. Oh I want Fish gosh. Frog Adventure, you know? Wow. Stormcrow, Chris at Dicetower.com. If you have pictures of the Dutch edition, if you have different ones, I would mm -hmm. love to see them. Please do. So anyway, there you go. Ryan Lockett got his start because of Dominion. So yet another go. reason Dominion is one of the best games ever made. Love it. Hey, I'm Jordan. Let's talk about a weeknight game. Now, a year or two ago, uh, one of the games that a game that came out uh, became a favorite in my house, and that was Dog Park. Uh, my uh, daughter really fell in love with Dog Park. I think the artwork was really pretty. It had a lot of uh, really accessible parts to it that wasn't really difficult. I mean, she's only like 11 or 12 at, at that time, so uh, it wor worked really well kind of with what she liked in games. Well, the pump company that made Dog Park, uh, Birdwood Games, I believe, came out with another game around the new year, and this is called Forever Home. And this is, uh, let's say it's a, in the same world as Dog Park, you know, in a world where dogs exist. In this one, you are taking dogs from a shelter, and then you are training them, and as they're getting trained, you're going to move them into different um, homes that are going to rescue the dogs or put them in foster homes. But as you're doing that, it's very abstract. It's got like tile movement. <laughs> you have this grid board and you're making different shapes of different colors. And as you accomplish those, you get to score to the different cards and then the dogs will go to these different um, homes. Very abstract, but it works super well. The window dressing in this, it's not like a very thematic game, but the window dressing works really well because it gives you, it kind of gives you that purpose. You know, why... Uh, is, you know, what am I doing with these dogs? It's not just like turn in these, uh, you know, turn these in for points later. It's, you know, you, you get to move these dogs up here and depending on the types of dogs that are up there, you know, they're going to these types of homes. And sure, it's super abstract, but it has a nice, it kind of comes together well. And frankly, it doesn't, it, it pulls away from the feel of an abstract game, even though it's mechanically abstract, it does work really well. So, this one's worked uh, really nicely at my house. Uh, I think the look is really accessible and inviting, um, but ultimately the gameplay holds up as well. So check it out, Forever Home. I'm Jordan, thanks.
So I was looking through the vault. <gasps> the vault. The, the Disney vault. The Disney vault? Yeah. No, the Dice Tower Disney vault. Um, and I stumbled upon. by Disney? Not that yet. Would be, that would be a massive buyout. It would be tens of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I, I found one. This is the Dice Tower Network News. So this was stuff that uh, so like Tom did the news before it was mm -hmm. part of before it was part of Breakfast before it was part of Smorgasbord, like all that stuff. So with it, there was industry news, and then there was Dice Tower Network news. Gotcha. And okay. so you'll see things where like Tom talks about. Uh, oh yeah, I should mute my computer. Um, Tom will talk about things like what at that time Shut Up and Sit Down were doing. And some of the like Ludology, the other Dice Tower Network podcasts and stuff, what they were doing. And so this one is he in a van? <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? So he's explaining that he had just set up for his daughter's birthday party, uh, and that the house was ransacked with children's. And so he's filming. He's hiding in, in the, the van. van. He's hiding I love in it. the My van. Goodness. I love it. <laughs> so he's like, I've been kidnapped. <laughs> I've been kidnapped by the kids. But here's the board game news. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I love watching these old news videos just to see what stories are coming out. This is a Quarrier's Quest of the Gladiator. You know, mm. this is when this was like a brand new announcement, yeah. for example. Uh, I remember those days. That's crazy. You know what? Tom was really ahead of his time. There are all those TikTokers that like just do it in their car. Hashtag van life. Right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's so many people. There's this like vocal coach lady that drives around with the person she's vocal coaching. And just in her car, like, what is she? Does she Uber for a living and like records in between stops? Like, I don't it's, know what's going it's on. It's a pretty popular genre on YouTube in general. Yeah. I mean, I know that Rado's been doing his whole like traveling around the country and doing videos from his like RV or whatever. So, yeah. Um, so Tom did it first, Tom. mostly because kids were ransacking his house. <laughs> you know, he's a trendsetter. Soul Forge. Oh wow! Before Soul Forge Fusion, even um, the new edition to Get Bit. Yeah. So. Uh, what does Tom call it? Archipelago. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the announcement of Archipelago. Nice. Um, but no, it's just it's fun. And then he, you know, he, he did. Wow, Lords of Middle Earth. Wow. I remember, I remember this time. Yeah, the Lords. Yeah, this you know, when this expansion came out for uh, War of the Ring. Here's the old Shut Up and Sit Down logo. Back when they were doing, I guess I guess the podcast was part of the network, right? Mm-hmm. That dog's Secret. a lot bigger now. That dog. Is it's that, definitely bigger now. Is that the same dog? I don't know if it's the same dog. That seems wrong. Because I don't think he got his dog until after I started working here. So, I don't know. Oh. Is that somebody else's dog? He, he found a dog. I don't know where the dog came from. But is it the same <laughs> dog? I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, maybe. But the microphone style makes me think it was different. So, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> Peekaboo Tom. Oh, man. Old Dice Tower. Oh. With its, uh, what do the kids call it? The chaotic energy. We try to bring some of that still. I, I love I loved it back in the day. It's so fun. Yep. I love it now, <laughs> but it's still fun. I agree. Well, there you the go. That's, that's the news from August 2012. A nice little look in the archive. Nice. Hello, this is Oliver, and today I want to do a little quick review of a fun fighting game called Meek Heroes Victory. One thing I like about this game is it has a very strong Christian theme. And as a Christian, and with a Christian point of view, I really like how they added the Christian element to this game. Like they put Bible verses on cards without descriptions, and they added little uh, like hints to Bible verses like fasting or the coat of many colors, which I thought was a really creative and fun way to add that Christian aspect with also being a fighting game. Another thing I like is the action selection of this game. It's very limited, so you're not like managing a million things, which for a lot of complicated strategy games, that does happen. So all you're doing is picking from one of the four resource types, or you're fighting a, the boss, which is super simple. And I also like how it's this little triangular effect, like one thing, then another thing. like. First you grab resources, then you buy cards, then that eventually leads to you defeating a boss later on. Which I just, I, I love that type of game, like Foundation Jerome does the same thing. And I really like this game called Minecraft Builders and Biomes. And there's this fighting system in the game where you're drawing out cards, 
and trying to defeat the bosses. And I never had appreciate like I didn't have appreciation for that fighting style as much as I do now. Like I never thought I did. But I and I was like when I played this game, I was like Minecraft Builders and Biomes. And I like this game for similar reasons. I like Minecraft Builders and Biomes because of that fighting system. And all right, that is my take on Meek Hero's victory. Have a great breakfast. All right, in the mailbag segment here, uh, people have submitted questions on the Dice Tower Discord. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an area there to submit questions for the mailbag. We pull out randomly, and I certainly don't strategically. Oh, choose ones choose that happen to ones. go with topics that we've already talked about today. And Maybe. specifically give them to people that might know how to talk mm -hmm. about those topics. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Complete <laughs> randomly. Uh, and then we also just throw a dart at people, and whoever, like whichever person the dart hits is the person that we ask to be the next mailbag gotcha, person. Yeah. What'd you so. say when the dart hit this person? I was like, oh, <sighs> that guy. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> so let's go see our mailman. That guy. what Chris got for me. Alright, what do we got? It says, as reviewers, you play a lot of games, so what are some key things that make a game stand out for you and your family so much that you need to own it and not just play someone else's copy? Oh, I think that's a great game. And as a, as a reviewer with multiple channels where I critically uh, look at games, uh, typically smaller games that can be played maybe on a weeknight, um, uh, over at Jordan Plays Blue on the various social medias. Uh, give me a follow if you want. But I think as I'm thinking about games that go in my collection, uh, a couple things that I I consider. One, I want to think about if the game fits in my collection. One, physically fits in my collection. I don't have a ton of space. I need to be able to have room for this. And so because of that, I don't necessarily back a lot of huge sprawling Kickstarters. I don't necessarily get deluxe versions of a lot of games because many times those come in bigger boxes but also what does the game bring to my collection it has you know it, it's going to hopefully do something a little different than other things in other games that I have but frankly I have some games that overlap like that um, that Ben Matt Riddle Ben Pinchback series of roll and write games I have all of them because I really like all of them and they do a lot of the same stuff over and over again so there's exceptions to all these roles I think what's probably most important for me is, is the game going to get played? And who am I playing the games with? I am one that is totally fine playing other people's games. I love going to game group and playing games that I don't have in my collection. I love playing games with other people. I actually, I will buy games and I might really like the game, but my friend likes it more. I will just give it to my friend. I'm going to get to play it again. Who cares if it's on my shelf or if it's on their shelf? I still get to play that game because um, my my friends' collections are ultimately uh, extensions of my collection, and my collection is an extension of their collections. That's you know that's what friends are for, right? To have games that you don't have, and I think that, it, that I wanted I want games that are going to get played. So if my wife really doesn't like the game and I really love it. Is it going to get played a ton? Probably not. I'll play it somewhere else, maybe. Or my kids really hated it. Maybe I won't keep it. Maybe I have friends that really like the game more. I'll give it off to them, and I'll play it with them sometimes. You know, as as Pedro in Napoleon Dynamite says, um, you just got to follow your heart. And that's what I always do. Vote for me, and I will make your wildest dreams come true. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I like this topic so much yeah. that, you know, it was almost the same topic as our top ten today. <laughs> it oh, it sure. was. Did that happen on purpose? Not particularly. Oh, okay. Yeah, but um, but I, I wanted to talk about that, and then the opportunity came up to have Jordan. Why do it. we own the games that we own? Yeah. Yeah, so this well, my is that's the, that's the twist on yeah. it. Yeah. I was going to say, my board game collection is an extension of Chris's board game collection. 
Shocking. And it would vice be funny versa. if you guys specifically kept them separate on the two yeah. different <laughs> galaxies or whatever. This is my copy. This is of my galaxy. <laughs> this is True. your galaxy. We'd have to have, yeah, duplicates of a lot. Like, well, we'd, we'd have to have three Calyxes. We'd have to have a Venn diagram of Calyxes. Like, this is my copy of Feast for Odin that I play with my friends. Because, like, can I play? I said my friends! <laughs> <laughs> uh, By the way, I just learned today that Violent Frog in the chat's name is Jordan. We got so many Jordans. So, it's a deluge, cool, a veritable deluge cool, of Jordans. For me, it's really, like, because I have access to the Dice Tower Library, which is just this weird, unique experience, um... The fact of like, I wanted to be games that like are games that I don't have time to go to work and grab. I wanted to be, I like the games that are gonna more easily make into my collection are games that I can play with like, like no, I wouldn't say non-gamer friends, but friends that don't play games as much. Cause you know, when I'm playing with my gamer friends, it's normally at the Dice Tower or at Dice Tower events. If I'm playing with my people that are not part of the hobby that still enjoy playing games, I'll do more party games or more lighter games or things like that. Um, and then just things that I can play with for family, you know, stuff that I want to take on trips with me because I'm not going to be taking like the Dice Tower's copy of this or that all over the place, you know. Um, so stuff that I want to have readily available to me all the time. And then for some reason, I own a ton of like gigantic epic games that sit on my shelf and I never play my copy of them. I play the Dice Tower's copies of them all the time. There's no actual reason for me to own them, but I love them and I need to have them. So that's it. So not foreshadowing anything because I'm really not foreshadowing anything. But at some point, like whether we're 50, 60, 70 years old, like we're not going to be a part of the Dice Tower anymore. We're not going to have <gasps> access to this library. Says you. Not foreshadowing no. anything. Right no. or die. <laughs> Once YouTube things... has ceased to be a thing and everything's in the, in the VR world. Oh, yeah. But they're just games that I don't ever want to give up. And so why would I sell the, why would I sell off some of my most favorite games? No, you're going to Rick even Astley if, them. Even if I don't play them, I don't understand that reference. Well, he, never you're never going to give them up. Them <laughs> you're never going to let you down. Yeah, you're going to run around and desert you. Yeah. Never going to virtual flea market you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's just those games that I want to keep forever, and I shall. Watch, I'll get rid of them just as I'm like moving. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, but I mean... I didn't play you in 20 years. I think something that you said, Roy, that, that speaks to me is, like, games that I'm going to own, and this has been true even before working here, when Damn. we had, uh, I had, like, a Vegas, you know, heavy gamer... Group. And you guys went to Thames a lot, too, so there was a library you guys could go to as well. We yeah. went to a board game cafe. We had buddies at that board game cafe that mm -hmm. owned all the Lacerda games. Mm. We've only ever owned, I think, one Lacerda game, and that's CO2. yeah. And that's because the, the things that we're going to own, oh, like prioritizing that over playing other people's copies, playing mm. library copies and stuff like that, is the stuff that I want to, that I know will pull out kind of impromptu. Mm. So like you're talking about party games. Yeah. I don't always plan to be like, you know, I bet tonight's going to be a wonderful day for telestrations. Let me plan to borrow someone's copy, bring it back. You know what I mean? That's like a, right. that's yeah. a game where yeah. you're just kind of sitting around and being like, hey, hey you know people what? Are over. Yeah. Like, hey, this is going to work great. So I bought a copy of Caesar's Empire because when we have people over, I'll be like, hey, I bet you've never played something like this. Mm -hmm. And I love, like, that's the type of stuff that I love having in the collection, even if you have access to it through other channels and other ways. And to be fair, like, I like party games, but they're not, I wouldn't say they're my most favorite games in general, but it's just way more accessible for people, you know? So it is. that's yeah. going to be the sort of thing that I, I actually own copies of. So. Yeah. But yeah, but you also want to own like you know your epic games. Yes, you, we want to own our like love. big old dry. So Euros, the people like, I can Frodo play the party stuff. games with, I can tell them about the epic games, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, we should totally play that," and I'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, well, we're not gonna yeah, play that for a while. No. You've got a few steps." <laughs> you got a few well, steps also, I make feel the like time. I feel like board games are decor. Yeah, I mean they're literally decor. Where, where's the board game? You play right at the, at the popcorn button. <laughs> <laughs> I bring out that abomination. Almost less than make it in his water. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I almost won one. It's circle DC. Okay. Oh, I saw that. I saw that they were auctioning one of those. Yes, off. I put all my tickets in it. <laughs> so whatever yeah. Liz wanted. So Liz, whatever Liz wanted yeah. because she got uh, Dave to put his tickets in there for her. Yeah. Uh, the scandal of the century. The anger. Yeah. No, it's fine. No, it was really funny. So yeah. So the story of that at the convention we went to, they had a bunch of different games that they were. Uh, you know, you get free raffle tickets each day. You could put them in different envelopes. And when you went all in on the Dune popcorn I wanted, the pop I wanted to be the person walking on the plane 
with my popcorn bucket because it wouldn't fit in my luggage. They were giving away like coin games. They were giving away like really cool things. They had copies of like Dodo's Riding Dinos, like other yeah. like not Fox necessarily experiment. historical games. Yeah. But the most tickets went into the Dune popcorn oh, bucket. Far. <laughs> I love it. The meme that it's become. Oh, great. man. All right. Well, folks. That was we've, a good breakfast. It was a good breakfast. we got a day mm. ahead of us. I believe that Tom is doing his Q&A today. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Q&A. Unfortunately, if you saw the schedule that we put up online, and we're going to make a, an update on uh, the Facebook group and the Discord group, it will not be a catch up a today. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. We just have a few things. Uh, to catch up on ourselves. Right. Internally in the office to actually get ready and stuff. But because, we will. Oh, because why? No, no, go ahead. Because... Starting Thursday, <gasps> 8 o'clock in the morning, there's a marathon. Are we going to play board games? 36 hour board marathon! Games. 30 hour marathon. We're branding it 30 hour 30 hour marathon! marathon. So 8 a.m. Thursday morning, mm -hmm. and it's going to keep going. We'll have two little meal breaks uh, in between, and it's going to go all the way until 6 p.m. of Friday. So We're going to play the board games. We're going to play the weirdest stuff I can mm. only imagine. It's going to be weird. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be bored. So there games. you go. Um, so looking forward to that. So until then, my name is Chris Yee. I'm Wendy Yee. And I'm Roy Kennedy. Vote for Pedro. <gasps> Oh, nice. Oh, we don't have an outro. That's <laughs> very strange. Oh, that's the wrong <laughs>